Uh, our next speaker is Professor Simon Baron Cohen, who you must hear. You've probably heard this every time. Sasha's cousin. I'm just. <laughs> I feel so privileged. <laughs> uh, hyphenated cousin. I understand. <laughs> so yeah, congratulations on your cousin. <laughs> um, professor Baron Cohen is a professor of developmental psychopathology at the University of Cambridge and uh, Director of the University of Cambridge Autism Research Centre, and that information hasn't gone out of date, has it? It's still the case here. Um, now, um, I, when I was just having a look at your kind of background from what I could glean on the internet, uh, what I got from that is I, I think you've published over 300 papers on, uh, and numerous books, and an uh, extraordinarily prolific creative career over the last 30 years, dating back to a lot of early work about theory of mind and dealing with the dilemmas faced by patients with autistic spectrum disorders and their families, uh, which I think it's fair to say have uh, shaped all of our thinking um, over the years um, as clinicians uh, interested in, in, in helping uh, this particular group of patients. Um, uh, so marvelous uh, contribution to psychiatry. Um, Professor, Simon ba uh, Professor Baron Cohen uh, has um, worked on issues of sexual dimorphism in the human brain and uh, differences of uh, adaptation between males and females um, and it, familiar work about systematizing and empathizing brains which I, I, I suspect may be part of your presentation um, uh, I think probably well author of um, a number of books which I think it's worth mentioning um, not not uh, in, 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 by name and in great detail, but just to make the point that I think you've written extraordinarily accessible books, which are um, very important because of their ability to um, share scientific knowledge, not only within the medical community, and they work very well as medical textbooks, but also within the much broader um, community of interested people out there, the general public, which is, of course, what we want to influence and, and shape. So um, we're very grateful to you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to take part in this uh, very interesting day. I'm sorry I missed the morning. I was here to um, catch most of your lecture, Randy, and that was a real privilege for me. Um, so I've been teaching um, psychology, atypical psychology, to the medical students in Cambridge for about 20 years and been given, giving them a lecture on evolutionary psychiatry. Uh, describing your work, making it accessible to doctors who are really at the beginning of their career, so that they're starting to think in this Darwinian way. So uh, some of you may, may be former students of mine, um, but hopefully these ideas are beginning to permeate into the field of psychiatry, so that we start thinking about the function of behaviours and emotions, not just thinking about how to eliminate them. So I'm talking about a neurodevelopmental condition, autism, again from an evolutionary perspective. And I thought I'd start just with a picture of a child with autism doing the classic thing that kids with autism do. So he's playing alone. It's one of the features of autism. He's not really interacting socially. Uh, but he's doing something intelligent. He's lining things up to make very clear patterns that he is imposing on the world. And as many of you know, kids with autism get very distressed if anyone disturbs their perfect universe, their order of patterns that they're creating. One other child, before we get into what we understand about autism, again, a child playing on his own. So it's uh, encompassing the word autism, which just means self not interacting with others, uh, but again doing something very intelligent. So he's playing with water and he's fascinated by the patterns that can be created as you block the flow of water with your hands. So fascination with patterns, uh, but solitary. What you probably know is that the prevalence of autism has been rising year by year. So this shows you data from the mid-90s through to the early 2000s. Uh, so autism has been getting more and more common. If we continue that graph, just looking at data from the US, from the Center for Disease Control, 
uh, you can see that the increase has continued. And if we go right up to the latest data, which is 2014, Center for Disease Control in the US, uh, the estimate now is autism is diagnosed in one in 48 boys and one in 189 girls. This is child data. And if you average across the two genders, it's about one in 68 kids end up with a diagnosis of autism. So this is way more common than when I first started out in this field back in the mid-80s uh, when Michael Rutter and others whose names you'll recognize were saying that autism was 4 in 10,000. So very rare. We now think of autism as very common. Um, and my talk isn't about why the increase, but I think we can probably attribute most of that to greater recognition, better awareness, a lot more services on the ground looking for autism, so more eyes looking for potential cases. And of course, we've broadened the definition of autism to include Asperger's syndrome. So we've, we've moved from a categorical diagnosis to a spectrum diagnosis and added a whole subgroup. And the graph on the right there really shows you at a glance the whole picture of autism because you can see that within both males and females, there are some people who have below average IQ, so they not only have autism, but they have learning difficulties as well. And of course, some who have average or even above average IQ, what we would call Asperger's syndrome. So we tried to measure this idea of a spectrum by creating something called the Autism Spectrum Quotient. It's a questionnaire that uh, adults can fill in for themselves, the AQ, so that's self-report, or parents can fill it in about their child. And each item on the questionnaire is one autistic trait. And the scale, as you can see, goes from 0 to 50. The dotted line on the left is the normal distribution that emerges when you ask adults in the population to fill in this instrument. So what that's telling us is that we all have some autistic traits. Nobody really scores zero. The solid line on the right uh, are the scores from adults who already have a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome. Uh, and again, we get this kind of bell curve. So there's a kind of range of scores. Um, but the point I wanted to make here is that there's a spectrum not only within those who come to the clinic, but it's a spectrum that runs right through the population. And evolution, natural selection, could well have been operating on those individual differences in autistic traits that we see in the population. So the first part of my talk is just to tell you what we know about autism. And I'm going to go through this at a quite a fast pace so we can get on to the kind of evolutionary relevance. But what we do know is that autism is in part genetic because if you've got one child with autism in the family, the likelihood of another child also having autism is one in three. So if we take the general population prevalence of about 1%, you can see that the presence of uh, one family member with autism rapidly increases the likelihood of somebody else also having it. So this looks like it's partly genetic. The reason I would say that, not just familial, but genetic, is that the hunt for autism genes is revealing hundreds of so-called risk genes. This comes from a website called safari.org, uh, where they report every new genetic association that's found for autism. So here are the human chromosomes, and the colored dots represent a published finding uh, of an, a, a genetic association with autism or Asperger's syndrome. What you can see at a glance is that almost every human chromosome harbors some genes for autism. So we know autism is not monogenic. It's massively polygenic. What we don't know is what, are, what these genes are doing, what their function is, uh, which genes are necessary and sufficient to cause certain types of autism or certain symptoms of autism. But there's no doubt that autism is in part genetic. But we know autism isn't completely genetic because of identical twins like these girls where one has autism and one doesn't. If autism was 100% genetic, if one has it, they should both have it. Um, so discordant pairs of this kind 
suggest epigenetic factors, environmental factors that can act on the gene in someone who's genetically predisposed to autism might also be part of the story. And you can see that this study from King's College London, um, uh, Robert Plowman's group, shows differences in gene expression in discordant twin pairs. In terms of what's going on in the brain in autism, we certainly see differences. So just zooming in on different structures, you can see a difference in the size of the amygdala in autism compared to controls, that the amygdala is larger in children with autism than in typically developing children. We also know that the brain in autism seems to be growing faster than in typical development. So on the left is a graph showing um, growth trajectories. Um, in blue are typically developing children who have each had two MRI scans so that you can join the dots to, to create growth curves. Uh, and in red are kids with autism, again, who've had a repeat MRI so you can look at how quickly the brain is growing. And you can see that the autism group at each time point is showing a larger brain, suggesting that the brain is growing quicker. The um, cartoon on the right comes from Eric Korshen's group in San Diego, a post-mortem study where you get the opportunity to look at the brain from people with autism and dissect it, observe it uh, in, um, uh, in fine detail finding 60% more neurons or nerve cells in the frontal cortex in people with autism than in comparison uh, brains. So the larger brain seems to correspond with a heavier brain if you weigh it at post-mortem and also more nerve cells, more neurons in different parts of the brain. Here's another structure which differs between autism and controls, the corpus callosum the connective tissue between the two hemispheres, which uh, in autism is smaller in the posterior part of the corpus callosum compared to typical individuals. So I'm just showing you some examples of differences in brain development, brain structure, and we'll come on to brain function to show that these kids, right from the earliest point, the brain is developing differently. This is a paper that was just published this year uh, Christine Ecker, again, at King's College London, but using data from uh, a national uh, data set um, showing that you can uh, identify in DTI, diffusion um, imaging, short connections and more long-range connections, and that in autism you find more of the short-range connections and fewer of the long-range connections than you do in a typical uh, sample. So again, just differences in the wiring of the brain. Again, back to the post-mortem evidence. If you just look at the individual neuron, the nerve cell, um, this is a very, I think, a very interesting study. So on the right, we've got a neuron from a brain uh, from someone who had autism, and on the left, a typical individual. And again, with the naked eye, you should be able to see more of the white dots all along the neuron, and each dot is a location of a dendritic spine, or uh, the location of synapses where the neuron is making connections with its neighbor. So this is suggesting more connectivity between neurons in the autistic brain, not just more neurons, but more connections between neurons uh, in autism compared to a typical brain, giving you a flavor of the differences uh, between someone with autism and someone without autism. So that's a bit about genetics and a bit about the brain. And of course, there are major differences in behavior and cognition. This is, again, a study from uh, UC San Diego um, by Karen Pierce. What they did was they looked at two-year-old children coming into the clinic, uh, and they presented them either with a face to look at as a, a social stimulus or a geometric design and they filmed how long each child looked at either the social or the non-social stimulus. What they found was that if a child looked, looked for more than 70% of the time at the non-social stimulus, the probability that that child had autism was 
So when I read this paper, I was sort of blown away that maybe a behavioral test could be diagnostic and it could save us hours of interviewing families and observing the child and so forth. Obviously, a caveat with a study like this is it was a clinic study. We don't know whether the accuracy would be as good if you rolled it out into the community, into the general population. But either way, just the take-home message from the study is that a typical child tends to naturally look at faces. They're drawn to look at people and presumably the emotional information in faces. And a child with autism doesn't show that, that typical preference. Rather, they're more interested in patterns, in this case, geometric patterns. So what we're seeing is evidence of difference, not necessarily pathology, just a brain that's wired differently and finds different aspects of the environment of interest. So other differences psychologically between autism and a typical person is in terms of attention to detail. Some of you recognize this um, task on the, on the left. It's called the embedded figures test, where you have to find the shape hidden in the overall design as quickly as you can. Uh, people with autism are super quick and super accurate on tests like this, where the cube is hidden in there. I'll let you see if you can find it. Uh, and when we've asked people not just to do this test at the behavioral level, but also to do it whilst they're lying in an MRI scanner, functional imaging, people with autism show less activity in the posterior parietal cortex whilst they're solving the task at a higher level. So the brain is, in some sense, more efficient. They're ending up with better performance, but showing less brain activity to achieve that performance. So differences in uh, function between the autistic brain and the typical brain. <coughs> Another suggestion that people with autism focus on detail whilst the rest of us focus on the big picture comes from the results of uh, the block design test, which many of you will have seen or used as part of the IQ test in children or adults. People with autism show their best performance on block design, where you have to take, you have to select which little cubes you need, uh, which have different colored faces, to create the design up above. And kids with autism are very quick at this, um, and they don't seem to um, improve in their speed, whether you segment the design as it's been done on the right to help a child to find the solution, or whether you just present them with the overall design. So evidence of superiority in understanding the components that make up um, a larger design. More, ev more evidence for people with autism being detail-oriented is in this test where you simply ask the person, what letter do you see? People with autism are more likely to report they've seen the letter H. Um, obviously, both answers, H or A, are correct. And the test is really just designed to see whether you're more focused on local detail or more global information, suggesting that people with autism are more detail or local oriented. And finally, a study that came out a couple of years ago showing, again, superior performance in kids on the autism spectrum in spotting patterns where you give them repeat information where, you get it, where the, the, the individual is getting a chance to learn that certain shapes always co-occur, always occur together. And kids with autism seem to be quicker at picking up these regularities. So when we think of autism, we think of it as a child who's quite isolated, trouble making friends, trouble communicating. We tend to focus on the social deficits. But we should keep in mind that autism is more complex than that. This 10-year-old child, Max Park, in California, loves the Rubik Cube. So he's fascinated by patterns. He's ranked in the top 100, 100 Rubik Cube players in the world. So whilst he has trouble socializing, He's also showing areas uh, of not just intact ability, but superior ability. So we need to think of both sides of autism when we try and think about um, how a partly genetic condition may have been selected for in evolutionary terms. And this is Derek Paravicini, who lives in this country. 
So he has a mental age of a four-year-old, very limited language, so learning difficulties. He's also been blind from birth, so congenital blindness, and he has autism. It's quite a package. Um, whenever he hears any jazz song that's played, he can immediately reproduce it after just hearing it once. Uh, if you play a ten-note chord on the keyboard, he can instantly identify all of the ten notes in the chord, suggesting that, in his case, the talent is obviously in auditory information, he's blind, but he can dissect the information into its component parts very fast, just as we saw on the embedded figures test or the block design test. The same ability that you see in autism of taking information and reducing it down to its component parts very rapidly and spotting patterns. So the other side of autism, which has only just made it into the latest DSM, DSM-5, is sensory issues. Parents and people with autism were telling us for about 40 years that they had sensory issues, but it wasn't part of DSM-3 or 4. It's now part of DSM-5. <coughs> Bless you. And uh, this is really showing you that if you put someone with autism into functional magnetic resonance imaging, you give them headphones whilst they're blindfolded, and you simply look at which part of the brain responds when they hear a tone, an unexpected auditory stimulus. You see a greater response in the auditory cortex in people with autism compared to the typical individual, suggesting hypersensitivity. This is obviously a study just in the auditory domain, but you could do the same in the tactile or the visual or the taste uh, uh, channels and still find this hypersensitivity. So in terms of the social difficulties, which we know are present, uh, the earliest demonstration of these comes from these studies. They're called uh, baby sibling stub stu studies where you know there's already one child with autism in the family, so you're watching the new baby in the family who's at genetic increased risk of autism. And finding that, um, for example, if you present them with a stimulus of the eyes looking direct at the infant or away from the infant, the P400 electrophysiological wave that can be recorded just using ERP or EEG type equipment is reduced in those children who go on to develop autism. So perception of faces and social information seems to be different. This is even uh, in the first year of life. This work comes from Amy Klin, who was at Yale University, has now moved to Emory, where he used gaze tracking to see where somebody looks whilst they're watching a movie. So this clip. Um, uh, is from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And um, in yellow, it, the gaze tracker is showing us that that's where the typical individual is looking whilst they're watching the movie, looking at Elizabeth Taylor's face, but particularly her eyes. And in red is where people with autism tend to look. So they are looking at the face, but focusing more on the mouth than the eyes. So the gaze tracking technology is giving us a window into what is of interest and what is uh, the attentional focus of people with autism. And as you kindly mentioned in the introduction, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, starting from our group but uh, many other groups looking at so-called theory of mind, the ability to put yourself into someone else's shoes and to imagine other people's perspectives, which children and adults with autism <coughs> find challenging so that they don't tend to participate in games like hide and seek when they're very young, or deception, which typical four-year-olds enjoy because they're keeping track of what other people know, what other people might want and intend. And instead, children with autism tend to avoid those kinds of interactions, finding them very confusing. We developed this test called the eyes test, which some of you may know, to measure social cognition in adults with Asperger's syndrome and in the general population. Uh, so you're shown photographs of the eye region of the face and you have to pick which of the four words that surrounds the photo best describes what the person in the photo is thinking or feeling. So very degraded black and white still photographs, uh, but people 
are pretty accurate at picking out that she's dispirited or a bit sad. Just from minimal information of emotions around the eyes, you can see that the data down on the, uh, in the graph on the left comes from thousands of individuals who've taken this test online, showing that both males and females with autism score lower on this test of reading emotions from the eye region of the face. And when we ask them to take that same test whilst they're lying in the scanner, we find that people with autism show less activity in the left inferior frontal gyrus whilst they're trying to decode someone's facial expression uh, from information around the eyes compared to a typical control group. So evidence, I hope I've presented for both talents but also disabilities in the same individuals. So some of you know that uh, just last year an important new book was published about autism called Neurotribes. It's by a journalist called Steve Silberman. Um, it won the Samuel Johnson Prize for Nonfiction, very deservedly, because it tells a whole new history of autism. But also, uh, if you look at the subtitle of his book, he talks about the future of neurodiversity. And his book, in many ways, is a sort of manifesto for this new concept of neurodiversity, which, as psychiatrists and clinical psychologists, we should be paying a lot of attention to because it's really the idea that there are many ways for the brain to develop. There isn't a single way to be normal. There are individual differences in the population which may be there for reasons of natural selection. We're not all made the same, that we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Um, and autism may be just one example of neurodiversity in the environment. Silberman chose as the front cover design for his book an image of biodiversity, and we're all very familiar with that related concept of how important it is for us to preserve diversity in the Amazon rainforest or elsewhere. And he really argues the same should be true for neurodiversity, that in any classroom of children, you're going to find some, some kids are more verbal, some kids are more spatial, some kids are more sociable, and some kids are more musical. And all of these different brain types, if you like, are part of the diversity that you find in any garden. Uh, so that in any primary school, you should expect two or three kids with autism to be part of that diversity. On the right here, we've got a picture of Henry Cavendish. Silberman devotes a whole chapter of his book to the biography of this physicist who was not only famous for the discovery of hydrogen, but as Silberman makes a very strong case, probably had autism. He did his absolute utmost to avoid people. Um, so he would leave messages for his servants and for other people he had to interact with rather than meeting them face to face. And was really just content to do his physics, to do his scientific experiments away from the social world. So here's the concept of neurodiversity attributed to um, Judy Singer, who has autism herself, uh, but which first appeared in print in 1998. The reason for dwelling on this is I think it's a revolutionary concept for our field. Um, and this poster is produced by the um, neurodiversity movement, which comes from the autism community, asking for autism acceptance, the idea that they're not necessarily inferior or impaired or um, pathological in some way, they're just different, just like uh, we might find amongst, um, for example, fruit. They're not all the same. For genetic reasons, we might expect them to be of different flavors. I think the notion of neurodiversity goes back quite a lot further than uh, I was suggesting. So here's Albert Einstein, and there's a quote from him on the left. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live believing it is stupid. So we just think about animals in different ways. Um, and Einstein, again, the case has been made that he might have had autism. Here's a quote from his, his biography. Uh, I do not socialize because it would distract me from my work. So he was really just focused on his physics. He did quite well. Um, he, he also enjoyed uh, sailing, but he did that alone when he was at Princeton, and he used to enjoy playing the violin. 
but um, you know, people weren't his main focus. The, the world of objects and the world of systems and understanding the laws behind uh, the, the physical world uh, which led him to his discovery of relativity. So here's Hans Asperger on the left, the pediatrician whose name is now given to one of those subgroups. And he said, for success in science, a dash of autism is essential. So there's that idea that autism might come, in, come by degrees. We might all have some of it. And maybe a certain modicum of autism might be quite good for focusing your attention just on one so-called so obsessional topic. Part of the autism diagnosis, as you know, is that they develop obsessional interests, but that's a rather kind of pejorative way of describing that they just have passions or interests. Um, and on the right here we have Newton, again the case has been made that he too had autism, so not only discovered gravity but famously fell out with almost all of his colleagues and had uh, difficulties with communication. So we see this potential link between autism and scientific talent at least speculated in biographies and anecdotes. Well, we've tried to measure this to see if it's actually the case. Um, <coughs> so we developed a questionnaire called the systemizing quotient, uh, which asks how interested you are in different kinds of systems, whether they're mechanical systems like computers, mathematical systems like mathematics, natural systems like the weather. And you can see that people with autism score higher in terms of their strength of interest in systems than people in the general population. We've also gone out to test whether kids with autism or Asperger's might be better at solving mechanical reasoning tasks, like this one, where you have to look at the wheel going anti-clockwise and predict what will happen to that point P. The correct answer here is, it, is C, it will move back and forth. And kids with, with Asperger's syndrome, age 12, outperform typical 12-year-olds in solving these kinds of mechanical reasoning problems, suggesting that despite their social difficulties, in certain aspects of the environment, their understanding is actually precocious. So I'm located at Cambridge. Uh, so opportunistically, we decided to look at the rate of autism amongst the math students at Cambridge University so we just asked them that very straight question, do you have autism? And you see, <laughs> you see the results show a much higher rate of diagnosed autism in students at, I would say this, a very good university uh, in the field of mathematics compared to the humanities. So again, reinforcing this idea that there might be a link between a lot of autistic traits or even a clinical diagnosis of autism and talent at understanding systems, including mathematics. And again, just taking advantage, if you like, of students being on the doorstep, we gave the AQ, that measure of autistic traits, to students working in sciences or in the humanities, finding that the scientists didn't have a higher rate of autism, they just had more autistic traits compared to those working in the humanities. So again, those individuals who are attracted by the more predictable world that can be systemized, which is what we do in science, where we try to understand lawful relationships between variables, might end up in science uh, and may have a higher number of autistic traits than those who can deal with the less lawful world of people, the unpredictability of people, and the way we write about people, for example, in literature. Where this link comes from between autism and scientific talent is likely to be genetic because years ago we looked at the occupations of fathers of children with autism, just asking them about where they work and finding a disproportionate number of fathers of children with autism work in the field of engineering compared to fathers of typically developing children. Obviously engineering is a very good case of um, where you need to be good at understanding systems, but to get the job you may not have been selected uh, on the basis of your social skills, more your understanding of how things work. So looking back where there's a child with autism in the family, at the genetics, if you like, what's been 
positively selected perhaps in evolutionary terms is not autism itself, but perhaps an aptitude for understanding systems, uh, which would be an advantage in fields where you're either building a system like engineering or trying to understand a system. We found the same pattern amongst the grandfathers of children with autism on both sides of the family. So this led to the prediction, is autism more common in places like Silicon Valley? So Silicon Valley has obviously been attracting people who have an aptitude for systems for quite a few years and they move there and they work there and they potentially start a family there and have children. So if there's a genetic link between scientific aptitude or technical intelligence and risk of autism in the offspring, we should see it in places like Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley is quite a long way away from London. So we went to a Silicon Valley a bit closer to home in the Netherlands and looked particularly at the city of Eindhoven. Eindhoven has got the Eindhoven Institute of Technology, a bit like MIT. It's also had the Philips factory there for over 100 years, attracting people to go and work there in the fields of electronics and more recently IT, so that now a third of jobs in Eindhoven are in the IT sector. And we compared the rate of autism in Eindhoven to two other Dutch cities, Utrecht and Haarlem, selected because they're of a similar size and similar demographic, and found that the rate of autism in Eindhoven was more than twice as high as in those two other Dutch cities. So this was based on school records, contacting every school in each of these three cities to ask them for the number of kids who already have a diagnosis of autism. Uh, we don't know much about the parents. This was a school-based study, but the inference is that this may be something to do with the parents' occupations. So, <coughs> um, to try to make sense of all of the data that I've shown you this, this afternoon, and to try and make it more relevant to an evolutionary perspective, I just want to mention the model that uh, was mentioned at the introduction, this empathy systemizing model. The idea is that in the population, in the general population, these are two dimensions along which we see individual differences. So along the y-axis, we've got empathy. And if you're at zero, it means you're absolutely average for the population. As you go up the y-axis, you're above average at empathy, or the ability to read other people's thoughts and feelings, but also respond emotion with an appropriate emotion. If you're below zero, it means you've got difficulties in that domain. And on the x-axis, we've got systemizing, the ability to, um, I, to understand a system, but also build a system by identifying the rules that govern the system, and so you can predict how the system works. Again, towards the right, so um, the positive values, you're above average on systemizing, and over to the left, you're below average. And the idea is that we all fall somewhere in this space, these two dimensions. What we found in our research is that in the dark blue quadrant up at the top left, more women in the population fall in that area where they've got above average empathy, but their systemizing could be anywhere from average through to below average. <coughs> Sorry, that's in the light blue part of the graph. Um, in the white part of the graph are individuals who are equally good at systemizing or at empathy. So they may be equally talented or equally challenged, but they don't show much of a, dis of a discrepancy in their aptitudes or abilities in both areas. The pink area is where most men, on average, fall in the population, where their systemizing is at a slightly higher level than their empathy. And what we were predicting is that people with autism would fall in the bottom right-hand quadrant, that dark red zone, where their systemizing may be anywhere from average to above average, but their empathy would be less than minus one, so in the below average range, which is often the trigger for needing a diagnosis, that they're struggling with relationships. So that was the model. And what we did was we went out into the population, we gave people these two questionnaires, the empathy quotient, which measures your empathy, the systemizing quotient, which measures your systemizing, 
Um, <coughs> and just sort of helping you read the data here, um, in yellow are females in the population. And you might be able to see them clustering in the top left-hand quadrant of the graph. In green are males in the population, where you might see them clustering uh, more in the center. And uh, in purple and uh, red are males and females with autism, who you might be able to see clustering in the lower right-hand quadrant. So each data point here is an individual. Um, and of course, all we can do is look at groups, males, females, people with autism, on average, because individuals may be typical or atypical for their group. So, <coughs> you know, we can, see, we can see a little green dot up here of a man who's well up in the female range on his empathy. Um, and we can see, you know, a woman all the way down here who's in the so-called autistic range. So individuals um, may not fit the trends for their groups. All we can talk about is statistical averages. But if we do a count for these different brain types, and this is my last slide, so we can leave time for discussion. This is what we find, that if we look at individuals whose empathy is at a higher level than their systemizing, we find more women than men in that have that profile. If we look at the opposite profile, individuals whose systemizing is at a higher level than their empathy, this is percentages. We find more men than women show that cognitive profile. And if we look at, a, at, a, at an extreme of this one, so systemizing is either intact or above average, but empathy is below average, well, this is where we find the majority of people with autism or Asperger's syndrome. So the data um, are in line with the directions predicted by the model. But really, the reason for leaving this up as my final slide is to show that diversity that exists in the population. We all fall in one or other of these five brain types, if you like, defined in cognitive terms, although increasingly we're starting to map their neural substrate and the both environmental and biological determinants of these different um, brain types. But we might well imagine that natural selection has favored one type of brain over another for different kinds of evolutionary niches over thousands, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years in primate evolution, some of which fall out along um, sex differences, but actually are nothing to do with your sex, because it turns out that prenatal hormones and genes play a much bigger role than your actual sex. Uh, and that people with autism may just be showing an extreme of the variation that we see in the population, selected potentially for their, their talents, being very good at spotting patterns, being very good at innovation, at understanding new machines or new tools that will help us, uh, even if they find the social world more challenging. So I'm going to stop there, thank our funders, and particularly the Autism Research Trust that supports our work, and we can open it up for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'm sure there'll be quite a number of questions, but could, could I just ask you briefly, I've had reason to um, work with uh, large numbers of transgender patients uh, oh, right. over the years. Um, and one, one of the observations I have is that there, there are certainly some trans women who will say, you know, I always socialized with women, and the reason I like doing that was that they didn't just kind of thump and kick each other, they talked to each other at school, for example, and it was a safer and better place to be. Uh, which seems fine and fits with the, the, the model, as it were. There are another group of people, though, who appear to uh, describe a kind of subjective change when they start to take, uh, when they begin oestrogen hormone treatment. Uh, and uh, I've just got a very vivid recollection of one patient in particular who talked about, you know, this sort of revelatory experience of being amongst the girls and, and finally feeling at home, as it were, which was very striking at the time. I'm not aware of... Uh, that should be, but not aware of uh, literature looking specifically at that group of people and particularly at hormone exposure yeah. for transgender patients. But I just wonder if you've got any 
knowledge of, of that area to comment on? Uh, well, just a brief comment, um, which is that the, um, the, the, the area of research of autism and gender is just beginning to open up, and including transgender. So we're now becoming a bit more aware that instead of uh, asking people for their sex and giving them a binary choice, male or female, we need to be a bit more um, sort of uh, fluid uh, because a lot of people with autism don't want to identify as either male or female and they prefer to tick the other box uh, and that increasingly a lot of people with autism are identifying as either transgender uh, or discussing how their gender doesn't fit neatly into traditional categories. So whether there's a hormonal element to this or some other factor, but there's, th this is a new area of research. There's certainly evidence for a, a, you know, a, a higher than expected number of trans male patients with autistic traits, and that would certainly be you know, our clinical experience. Right. Anyway. Okay, so um, do we have the furry microphone somewhere? Uh, pause. Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Do engineers that marry have as many children as others? Do because engineers marry and have as many children? Yes, because the evolutionary theory yeah. would be about reproduction. Sure. So presumably people with autistic traits, if there's an evolutionary advantage, some would have as many children, not less, because it's difficult to explain autism in evolutionary terms yeah. if it decreases fitness. Sure. Um, <coughs> so I don't know the data on fertility, fertility rates amongst engineers versus other groups in the population. Maybe other, someone else does. Um, but, you know, if you think again about um, f fertility in relation to resources, an engineer could be someone who ends up with considerable resources if they have the skills and the, the tools that other people need in the community. So if uh, engineering skill is related to resources, we know that you know f there is a connection between wealth, economic status, and fertility rates. So that may explain the persistence of the range of autistic, or at least engineering type autistic genes. Yeah, I mean the puzzle always was that, you know, back in the old days, the kind of autism we saw in the clinic, we couldn't really imagine this person ever growing up to have a relationship, let alone an intimate relationship that might result in children. So why were the genes for autism persisting in the gene pool? Now we've broadened autism into a spectrum and we can look at Asperger's syndrome and we see what's called the broader phenotype amongst the parents of children with autism, uh, which might include skills in engineering or in uh, technical intelligence. We can see that actually there's plenty of scope for these individuals, not only having married and had children, so passing on their genes, but maybe even being selected, positively selected, by a mate uh, for those positive traits. Bill Gates would be quite attractive. Well, Bill Gates is a really interesting example. So everyone speculates that he's got autism. He resists the idea. So any time a journalist, a journalist tr tries to sort of thrust a microphone into his, into his face and say, you know, Mr. Gates, do you have autism? Or you know, kind of the, the sort of uh, blunt way that journalists sometimes do. He gets sort of irritated, but those people who've worked with Gates uh, sort of report that actually he's got a lot of those behaviours and he's done quite well. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts about uh, the contention uh, that autism uh, represents a slow life history strategy or is associated with a slow life history strategy and that um, their reproductive success or niche is with uh, a state of intense monogamy and long-term relationships and investment in a single relationship as opposed to uh, psychosis which is claimed to be a fast life history strategy and that I mean there has been this research and these claims I don't know what your thoughts are about that yeah I don't, I don't know that research but I mean it, it makes sense the way you're describing it slow life and fast life uh, certainly there's quite a lot of data that's accumulating showing that fathers of children with autism tend to marry late. So maybe that fits in with the slow life, yes, is that right? Yes, it would do. Um, and you know, it's been kind of open to interpretation as to why that's the case. 
Um, and some people suggest, well, that could just be because their social skills are not as great. They've got some of the genes for autism because we see it coming out in the next generation. So maybe they've just taken longer to find a partner because of reduced social skills. But, I mean, it, you know, I, I guess you're talking about slow life and fast life yes. trajectories which may not be sort of un under the, you know, within the awareness of the individual. These no, are just... It wouldn't be. Sure. But that's very interesting. From one Simon to another, I'm uh, Simon Forster from Redcar, and uh, I'm a child psychiatrist, so I'm fascinated by autism, and I heard you talk 20 years ago, and you're just as accessible and entertaining as you were then, so it's great to hear you again. Um, what I'm wondering is the, the extent of genetic, uh, um, or the, the extent uh, that the genes are distributed amongst the chromosomes, doesn't that suggest that autism is very old? It's been with us for a long time. Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, <coughs> that might be one implication. Um, so, you know, the, one, one view about the genetics of autism is that it's not about diseased genes or, you know, mutations, rare mutations, although there are rare mutations that can give rise to so-called syndromic autism. Uh, but autism may also be the result of common variants in the population, and that these common variants may be distributed in, you know, right across the genome. Each of these common variants may be contributing very small effects, so it may be combinations of particular variants that are not disease genes, they just uh, contribute in different ways to, um, to skills, whether it's language or whether it's mechanical skills or, or any other. Now you're sort of suggesting that because we see those dots right across all 23 pairs of uh, chromosomes that that means it's very old. Another view might be that actually the epigenetic factors are more important. That actually maybe the epigenetic factors can, uh, can influence a lot of gene expression and that when we pick up uh, genetic findings, we're kind of we're not looking at the epigenome. Uh, so there's different ways of interpreting it. Um, yeah, yeah, I just think that the first person that picked up a burning stick or a bit of half half burnt flesh from a, a thunder and lightning storm and thought, well, this is tasty. Um, uh, maybe we can reproduce this effect ourselves. <laughs> were they systematizers? Sure. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I think, I think you're sort of raising the question about, um, about when in evolution did some of, some of these very human attributes first emerge. And I think if you look at the evidence from um, tools, for example, the fossil evidence from tools in, in evolution, you'd probably go back at least 70,000 years in terms of when tool making really took off and where you can see the evidence of a very systematic mind uh, varying their tools, which you didn't really see much before 70,000 years ago. Spiros Carbonis, I'm a, a, a consultant on adult psychiatrist. I've been, um, I have been seeing people with autistic spectrum in the clinics over the years. And one of the things that uh, Im impressed me, it was in the, what I had in my mind, the difference between Asperger's and autism in that the autistic people, they did not want to be with people, where the Asperger's wanted to be with people. And it seems that that, that has, it's as if it's not so much important, but if for me, in the clinical practice, and especially how you can deal with the people, it yeah. makes a huge amount of difference. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's not um, binary that you either want to be with people or don't want to. It's probably about the kind of dose of social interaction that each of us enjoys. So some of us enjoy seeing a friend once a week. Other people need to see a friend once a day. You know, so, so there's individual differences in social motivation and social um, behavior. Uh, and and uh, you know, whether it's a kind of discriminator between autism and Asperger's, I'm not sure. Because even within the group called Asperger's, you see quite a variation that some people are very content just being solitary, 
and they actually sleep during the day. They're awake at night because then they're not, they're not uh, having to have any social contact. Um, and others, you know, do want the social contact but don't have the social skills to know how to have those relationships and so feel very lonely and isolated. So I think there's kind of there's individual differences even within Asperger's syndrome. Do you ever feel that events move a predisposition, a predisposition to autism to a more florid form? And if so, what sort of an event? I see. Um, so I think of the word florid as um, the word that sort of adult psychiatrists use in relation to psychosis. You know, that kind of, you know, you suddenly see all the symptoms, you know, blossoming. Um, whereas in autism, I don't know that we kind of really think about the manifestation of symptoms in this kind of florid way. I think it's much more sort of um, that if you look back, you can see a particular pattern of behavior that was there right from the earliest point. So in, I, I work in a clinic, NHS clinic for adults with suspected Asperger's syndrome. But we asked the parents to come along with their 40-year-old son so that we can get a developmental history of was the pattern of behavior there even at primary school. And so it's not so much this kind of florid explosion of symptoms where there's a trigger. It's more that actually right from the earliest point, this was a child who didn't really socialize in the same way. They were more focused on objects than on people. Maybe they didn't need a diagnosis in primary school or even secondary school because they somehow sort of managed. Uh, in primary school, maybe they were focused on their academic work, didn't really mix with kids in the playground. In secondary school, we often see a kind of more difficult picture where suddenly the adolescent teenage group is uh, much more demanding of, you know, and, and if you don't have social skills, it's much harder to navigate that. So a lot of the kids get their diagnosis for the first time in secondary school, but some of them have managed to get through till they leave home and they go to college and then they need their diagnosis or when they are not functioning well at work, so in midlife. So it's not about particular triggers, it's about what, you know, what niche they're in, who's protecting them, whether it's their family up until a certain point, who's concerned about the child or the individual, and at what point do they, do their symptoms, their autistic traits, start to interfere uh, just, with their, with their ability? One point. I was told as a student that a number of children became autistic when their fathers came back from the war. Right. And you, the, the <coughs> association between mother and child was interrupted. Right. So I would say that probably theories of autism have changed. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, we used to have all sorts of theories about autism to do with how the mothers were cold and unemotional uh, or maybe over-involved with the child. And, you know, so I can imagine this kind of event of the father coming back from war might have fitted into certain kinds of theories of autism. But I think nowadays we kind of understand autism as this biomedical neurodevelopmental condition, um, which I've hoped I've shown is, is just a different pattern of you know, the, the relative um, sort of uh, focus that the, that the individual has on the social world versus the non-social world. Um, and that sort of events that might happen in the child's life about whether the father is absent or present, is, they're probably less important than the genetic predisposition. Uh, and there, are, there must be environmental factors, but we're not very good at identifying what those are yet. I guess if dad comes home with PTSD and takes, takes to whiskey in a big way and starts knocking mum around, that might have an impact on the social skills. Well, but for, for, for any child, yeah, that's so right. Maybe a confusion yeah. of sure. phenotypes, as it were. Yeah. I, that's just a thought. There's a question, I think, on the... David Guiney, retired psychiatrist from Oxford. Um, could I ask you a little bit about the group uh, at the other end of the spectrum? That is the sure. individuals who are very high empathizers yeah. and low in system systematizing yeah um, wh what are they what is this group like sure. uh, clinically uh, so are, are they uh, the I think the word, well the word clinically is probably the most important word here because they may not come to clinics yes. so these people have got very good empathy 
So we might infer that they, they've got good social network and good relationships, friends, um, you know, community. So actually they may be protected from needing to go to a clinic. It's probably the people who have below average empathy who struggle with, with relationships who might then develop secondary depression because they're isolated, who, are, who end up coming to clinical attention. So the people up at the top left-hand quadrant with super empathy may be doing just fine. We don't know too much about them. We know that they exist because you can see them there. We can see more yellow dots, so there's more females, but you can see the, the odd green dot. Um, and uh, we know also that they may struggle with systems. So maybe at school they didn't enjoy mathematics or the natural sciences and went for other kinds of subjects, and that when the computer goes wrong, they just phone the help desk. So, you know, I, th I don't think that these individuals would necessarily um, have problems. They just are part of the variety we see in the population. I, I suppose I was wondering whether they were the group that one does see from time to time, uh, people who are, do seem deeply empathic but really very disorganised. And the, the sort of term, I'm not sure if it's at all PC, the term that springs to mind is scatty. Uh, and, which is uh, not a clinical diagnosis. Which is no, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a non-clinical term, yeah. but it, it's a description of, what, of, what, uh, of, of how a person may be like that. And I'm, yeah. I'm thinking wow, how that fits into the evolutionary picture. Right. I, I, if, if you think that is, that could characterise what that sort of person might be like. Right. Uh, so as I say, we don't, we don't, there hasn't been much research into the people who are at the opposite end of autism. So we know a lot about people with autism because they come to clinical attention and then they make it into research studies. The group at the other end of that dimension, if we think of the diagonal, uh, we know less about. Maybe they've got sort of executive type problems um, in being very systematic in organising things, but I think that may be a bit too simplistic because people with autism can also have those executive type organising difficulties. Um, we just don't know, but I think it would be good to have more research into that other group. I, I just wonder whether those of us who might ask you that question are, tend to be male. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, just, I, I've got two, two daughters, both have you know, gone through adolescence, and I have to say they're both shockingly empathic, and I've found it very difficult to comprehend at times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we're sort of a coffee time, I think, really, unless there are any really pressing questions. So, um, so I think, uh, first of all, just to thank you very much for a really enlightening and um, beautifully flowing presentation, which I think has just, you know, uh, been excellent uh, for us as clinicians. And, and to think about, in terms of the evolutionary background to these conditions, I'm choosing my words carefully there. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.